Welcome to Diffusing Nerds. This is episode 45 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is Pervez Ahmed. Hey, Zaki, and uh, welcome back, listeners. Uh, good, to, good to be back. Uh, it's been a minute, and uh, we've got a lot going on to process and sort of to uh, look, uh, to sort of examine. And, uh, and imagine, Zaki, you're doing the same on your end in terms of... Uh, all the, uh, all the all the craziness coming out of Washington, and, what, and this past weekend we've had the uh, inauguration. We're recording, guys, uh, a couple of days after the inauguration, and as well as the uh, massive protests the globe over. Um, so, not sure if you have any thoughts, Zucky, on that initially. Well, I, I have plenty of thoughts, but I want to share those thoughts in conversation with our guest for this episode. And we are joined by my friend Zaki Barzinji, who uh, is a former president of Muslim Youth of North America. He's former deputy director of intergovernmental affairs for Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe. Last year, he joined Barack Obama's White House as liaison to the Muslim American community under the Office of Public Engagement, which is a job he served in until last week's inauguration of President Donald J. Trump. Uh, here to discuss... His interest in politics, his working in the White House, and his thoughts on this election is Zaki Razinji. Zaki, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. So so uh, two Zuckies on one show. This is like Thunderdome <laughs> now, I think. <laughs> two Zuckies enter, only one leaves. I think that's how it works. <laughs> So, uh, I was thinking of the Highlander. There can only be one. Oh, this is true. There you go. See, see, Zeki and I are friends because of our mutual sort of geeky affinities. <laughs> I think <laughs> we we can. I think I think Pervez. I think me and Zeki can out geek even you. I think that's my. Uh, I well, I'm not going to even try. Zeki squared is always greater than P. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so okay. Obviously, the the election and everything that went down. I definitely want to want to get into that with you. Uh, but before that, I, I want to lay the, the stage for that a little bit. Your your own interest in politics. I mean, where did it come from? Yeah, so I um, so I was born in Maryland. I grew up in Northern Virginia. Um, the first real interaction I had with politics was when I was about thirteen or maybe fourteen, um, when my mom actually decided to run for office. Wow. Um, she ran for a uh, county level position in uh, Loudoun County, Virginia. Which and this was shortly after 9/11 as well, and so my mom decided to run as a Democrat, as a Muslim who wore hijab. Shortly after 9/11, all of those aspects of her identity were all like working against her, wow. <laughs> running for a supervisor seat. And um, and you know and and she kind of did it like on a whim um, after some pressure from other people to do it. And what it meant was I, I was you know I was a, a little teenager, but I ended up going with her from door to door knocking on people's houses and making phone calls and interacting with people I never would have interacted with otherwise. Um, and, you know, that just from that early moment, it made me feel like, wow, the power of politics and campaigning to transcend boundaries is, is great. There's actually, there's this like one specific inst instance where um, she knocked on the door of this guy who opened the door and like he had a shaved head, he had two like, bulldogs on either end of him and he had a big confederate flag hanging behind him and i was like um i don't think you're gonna find anything in common with this guy can we get out of here before like <laughs> you get assaulted verbally or physically and instead she like she stood her ground and she put her hand out and she's like hey my name is afifa i'm running for supervisor i'd love to hear your issues and the guy like took a second to to respond and in that second you know we were kind of thinking like oh man this guy's gonna just like unleash a storm of of <laughs> of, yeah. of verbal abuse but instead he said like oh well you know what i actually care a lot about fishing permits and it's been very hard for me to get a fishing permit if you can help me with that issue you got my vote wow and like in that instant i was like oh my gosh that's crazy i judged this guy so much and i never would have talked to this guy on the street in any other uh instance or circumstance but because of the power of politics and campaigning we were forced to talk to this guy, and we figured out that you know there might be more opportunities for understanding than we thought. So that's that was like the defining moment that really set me on that path. Wow! So um, that, that's your origin story right there. <laughs> exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Wow! And, and and I'll say that another part of it is I've also always been obviously into nerdy stuff. Sure. Um, but also into you know storytelling more generally. Um, I almost went to school for. Uh, filmmaking. I almost actually went to NYU film school, 
But the last minute, I decided to go to an in-state school instead to do political science. Mm -hmm. But the idea of storytelling and narrative building and all that never really like left my, um, you know, my consciousness. I always, I always saw the power of storytelling and also the power of politics as being completely intertwined. Sure. So I, I would say that every position I've ever had, you know, in my career has been kind of all about that, that marriage between using government and politics and engagement, also marrying that with, you know, the power of narrative. Uh, well, story and, and, and I think just what you're describing and the, the idea of all politics being personal. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, at, sure. at the end of the day, the, this gentleman who you your, your mom encountered, I mean, it, all, all the sort of broader social issues notwithstanding for him, it was, hey, I like fishing, fishing permit. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly right. Yeah, exactly. So this was, you said this is shortly after 9-11. Yeah, I think it was 2002 or 2003. I mean, it was still in that same climate of... Yeah. Like Muslims are the are the worst, and all that. As opposed to our current climate, where none of that is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Like Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so uh, you now now you 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 went to a state school. You said rather than going to film school. Yeah, I mean, I don't think my parents ever expected me to actually get into NYU film school, mm -hmm. um, which is why they let me apply in the first place. And once I got in. <laughs> Once I got in, they're like, hmm, um, actually, the ROI on you going to yeah. your private school to study film is not so great. Um, yeah, I think so, yeah, so my, I my parents there. are realizing that now, you know, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So I ended up going to, um, to Virginia Tech, uh, which is an in-state school for me, and I did political science and English, a double major uh, in that. But, I, but like I said, like I never – creative writing and, and you know, creative expression was never – never far from my interest level. And I think I've always tried to infuse that in everything I've done since. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about going to work with Governor McAuliffe. I mean, uh, how, how did yeah. that come about and what, what were your, your duties while you were there? Sure. Well, so it started with um, actually a group of business owners or small business owners in Virginia, majority of whom were Muslim, um, decided that they wanted to get more involved in politics at the state level. And so what we did actually, before I even joined the governor, is we, we set up a, a, a chamber of commerce for Muslim-owned businesses and also a PAC to go along with it. And we found that when we come to the table with, with policymakers and candidates as business owners, instead of just, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, like grassroots activists, sometimes you can get even more traction for the community because you're not just making moral arguments, you're also making economic arguments. Um, so what we ended up doing was we raised, uh, you know, we raised some money through our PAC, uh, and, and we got the attention of the campaign and then the campaign decided to hire me full time, okay. um, for the governor's campaign. And I was responsible for all kind of ethnic outreach for him throughout Virginia, which means, you know, I was doing outreach to Asian Americans, to, um, uh, Armenian Americans, to wow. Eritreans, Ethiopians, anybody who had a you know, different language or different religion that nobody else understood ended up on my plate. Okay. And, okay. and it was a great experience. I mean, again, it was a great uh, example of how powerful campaigning could be because for every each one of these little communities, I was forced to uh, figure out how to package kind of the candidates, uh, you know, more general broad-based issues. How do I make these immediately relevant to these niche communities that nobody ever talks to? Um, and it was a very valuable experience from that end because it made me kind of – it forced me to go into these communities, listen to them, figure out what their issues are, and kind of in a genuine and authentic way figure out how to say, okay, my candidate can help you in all these different areas yeah. and he will listen to you and things like that. Um, so that was eye-opening. And, uh, and then was after – right was, was this right after school? Like, did, I mean, were you right out of undergrad doing this? No, no. So I – well – no, after undergrad, I uh, yeah. I spent a couple years doing um, like consulting for different NGOs and nonprofits, okay. um, and then and then I started the Chamber of Commerce, and we ran that for about a year or two, and okay. then the governor's campaign was actually in 20, uh, 2013. That's when I joined the campaign. Twenty thirteen, okay. Twenty thirteen was when the governor's campaign. Yeah, so the governor's race in Virginia is always the year after uh, the presidential election. Um, and so, so after he won, uh, he actually hired me as his 
a policy advisor down in Richmond. And wow. uh, because I had worked for the this Chamber of Commerce and because most of the companies I had represented, even though they were Muslim owned, they were also tech companies. So I used that kind of as a way to say, you know, I'd like to I'd like to work on technology and innovation policy. Uh, in my role as your policy advisor. So that's what I did for about six months in Richmond. I, I advised him on state legislation that was related to technology and innovation and open data and big data and things like that. And then I got bumped up to a role in DC um, for two years where I served as his deputy representative to the federal government and also to Congress and to other states. So basically my job was to be like the ambassador for Virginia mm -hmm. to right. the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, that's what I was doing, um, up until the point where I got hired by the white house. So before, and we definitely want to get into that, but before we even right. do, I mean, I think that there, there's something really interesting that I would love for you as somebody who's been on the ground, you know, in the, in the thick of things in politics wise to sort of tell, tell the audience, I mean, what is your experience in terms of, you know, we, we tend to have two warring visions of, of the political process. One, which is sort of this, just the muck of corruption and then sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, all the good stuff. And I feel like, I mean, politics ultimately is the art of the possible. So, I mean, in, in with that in mind, what was your experience as your, uh, I don't know, preconceptions met with the reality of sort of being in, in the thick of it, so to speak. Do you mean for uh, in the White House or before that? Be before that, yeah. I mean, just working with Governor McAuliffe and, and then going and, and going to, you said you went to D.C. on his behalf. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's always been an interesting experience for me because you get to see all sides of things. And I think that from an outsider's perspective, it can often seem pretty binary, right? Like either everybody's corrupt and everybody's got their own, you know, fake agenda or their own fake persona and nobody is in anything is into anything for them into anything other than for themselves. Um, that's definitely that's that's you know you naturally have that perception because that's kind of what you see not just in media but also in reality often. Right. Um, but going there and especially because my introduction to to federal government was from this very specific lens where I was representing a governor, which means it was the nexus of state government and federal government. Sure. So you got to see a lot more of the in the weeds kind of policy discussions that happen. And uh, what I realized pretty quickly was that. You know, you always think that there's this, like, partisan gridlock and Republicans, Democrats never talk to each other about anything. Um, but then the issues that I was working on were things like transportation, um, cybersecurity, um, uh, even on certain education issues, you realize there's actually a lot more um, conversation and a lot more dialogue and a lot more working together than you would, you know, originally imagine just looking at Washington from afar. Sure. And I got to be in the thick of those conversations. And a big part of my job was because I was representing the governor, it meant that I was working with a lot of members of Congress who were from Virginia. And the majority of them actually are, are Republican from the House side. Okay. Um, and yet I was working with them all the time because they were in, you know, they had the best interests of Virginia in mind. And so, you know, there's a lot of space for collaboration there. And so I will say that, that being there and working with like, especially the staff level with people from, different offices, you learn very quickly that, you know, the basic fact that everybody's human hmm. and for the most part, nobody is outright malicious towards you, no matter who you are, or where you're coming from. You know, they definitely have their own very closely held beliefs, but it's not like a battle royale that I think lots of people think it is. And again, I think the biggest point is most of the work that gets done is done on the staff level. The people that you know you, you rarely actually see in the news, the people that don't actually speak on the floor, they're the ones that are making all the negotiations. They're the ones that are working with each other to push out legislation, um, who are listening to constituents, who are uh, making deals and all that. It's rarely the actual figureheads themselves doing that kind of work and that kind of dialogue. Um, and that's also, you know, I think it's a it was a reassuring thing to see that because then you realize that you know this thing is much. There's much more nuance than you would imagine just looking at it from the outside. But what the, the nuance you're describing, I mean, is, is would you say things are different at, at on a state legislative level versus uh, na legislating on a national level? Yeah, I mean, the thing with state legislation, and this is also why I encourage the, – the thing that I, have, I say to the community often is that we rarely ever get involved in the state-level government. 
But at the end of the day, state level government was a lot of, is where the rubber really meets the road. I mean, it's where you the budgets that you pass in state government have a direct impact in the daily lives of people who live in that state. And mm-hmm. because that's the case, there's a lot less room for political posturing. Usually, I mean, on most issues, at the end of the day, you have to pass a budget because it's going to mean literally directly connected to the live livelihoods of, of your people in a way that federal congressional legislation is not often the case. In Congress, you can pass a bill that's not going to take effect for years down the line. Um, you can k- keep on uh, applying temporary patches to funding things and, 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 and do that like ad infinitum. But in state government, you only have a certain amount of money. And you have to make sure your programs are funded, and if they're not, then jobs will be lost immediately, huh. and people's lives will be impacted immediately. And because of that, I, th- I felt you know, working in, in state government, there's a lot more room for compromise. There's a lot more room for deal-making and, and all that because at the end of the day, you don't actually have the luxury to, to do posturing. It's not, and that's not to say that there wasn't – you know. The line that there, there wasn't a lot of like you know political back and forth, especially working in Virginia, where the governor is a Democrat and the state legislature is actually controlled by Republicans. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of like friction there. But at the same time, you did see that there was more opportunities to make things happen. And also, I would the last thing I would say is that stuff can happen much more quickly at the state level than it can in Congress. Sure, and that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Right. Um, it's why you'll see also a lot of the kind of anti-Muslim. Um, you know, so-called anti-Sharia bills uh, have been, you know, yeah. progressing very quickly in state legislatures across the country because once all it takes is a couple of state legislators, legislators to get on board with it and they can push it very quickly and it can move forward and, you know, nobody's paying attention to what's happening in state government anyway. So this kind of – the more crazy stuff can happen quicker at the state level. And that's why, again, I think that it's important for all of us, even if we're not involved in politics – to always keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening at the state be, level. Be aware of the what the legislatures are doing. Absolutely, and especially if you live in a state that's not like super blue or super liberal. Well, and we, I mean, to some extent, we see that in you know in in twenty ten or whenever that was with Scott Walker and the um, yeah. anti union measures, and then Pat McCrory with the the anti trans bill and yeah, uh, North, I mean it's it's oh, yeah. in North Carolina, right? It's it's. Um, it's it's very it it's that's that's a, a marked contrast to measures like that that as you say would take much longer or would need a, a much wider sweep to be able to pass in in the in Congress. Exactly, that's exactly right. And there's you know when nobody's paying attention, then it's a lot easier to get crazy stuff pushed through. So having having worked with with Governor McAuliffe, who I mean, he he, he seems like a like a, a fundamentally decent man. I mean, what what did you take away? Like, what what are some of the the lessons that you took away from from that experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are few. It's very easy in politics to meet people who are all artificial and all fake, mm-hmm. um, and you can very quickly tell just by the way that they talk, the way that they interact with people that. They, you know, that they're plastic people. Basically, they they don't like what they're doing. They have no actual empathy. They're just it's all a stunt. Working for Governor McAuliffe is clearly not the case. I mean, he's a guy who definitely says what's on his mind at any given <laughs> time of day, and you can tell that just by searching his past appearances on talk shows. I think he appeared on the Daily Show a couple of times in two thousand eight and had some pretty memorable uh, appearances. <laughs> but he's somebody who. Um, you know, every time he's in a room with people, like he'll, he makes you feel like he cares about what you're, what you're saying, and he usually can pull out a fact or two about whatever very specific issue that person is bringing up. Um, he's somebody that told me from day one that he wanted to see. You know, he said he very clearly said, "I want to have the most diverse administration I've ever had. I want to make sure that you know groups that traditionally get underrepresented are are represented in my administration." Um, he's somebody who. You know, from the very start, made sure that we had meetings with uh, with the Muslim community um, during the campaign. He went to at least two or three mosques, and he said that even after I get elected, I want to come back to these mosques and show that it wasn't just a campaign thing. I want to; it's a relationship that I see as being a long term huh. relationship. And he he did the same thing with you know all the different communities that I was responsible for representing him to, um, whether it was the Vietnamese community or the Korean community. I mean, he he genuinely he had that genuine belief that 
you know, these communities were underrepresented and needed to be better engaged. And I would contrast, and, and I think that there's a fine line between doing engagement of minority communities and then just straight up pandering to minority communities. Right. And I would say that the Republican Party is very good at pandering. Hmm. Um, and I saw it. So the, the funny thing is uh, the governor's election was a year after 2012. So it was a year after, obviously, the Republicans had lost, or Mitt Romney had lost. And so the Republican Party was doing this whole kind of soul-searching thing. Yeah. And they realized... The, the autopsy. They to... Exactly, right. And so one of the first things they did was they hired a full-time Asian-American outreach person at the RNC. Hmm. And then his very first project was the 2013 Virginia governor's election. So hmm. everywhere I went, every like Asian-American event I attended, I would see this guy there too. And I would see, and he was a, he was a, he himself was a, was a great guy. I got, I got to know him pretty well over the time. Mm-hmm. But the approach of Republicans was to show up to every like ethnic minority event they could, and just like put stickers on everybody and like tell them, oh yeah, vote for us, we're the best. Not make any attempt to engage on a deeper level with uh, their issues or what they're feeling or any of that stuff. It was all about let's just like plaster these guys with our let's just like spam the hell out of these guys with our own like campaign messages. And, you know, they won't know any better. They're just by seeing our name and our faces, they'll, they'll translate into votes for us. And that ultimately, obviously, was a failed strategy. I mean, what we did was so much more deeper and authentic than that because yeah. we actually had listening sessions. We actually went in and we had them tell us what their issues were. We, um, we, we didn't just, like, spam them with our generic campaign stuff. We took time to carefully tailor our... Uh, our policy positions and tell them why what we were proposing was immediately and directly relevant to their community. Right. And that makes a big difference, I think. And, and I think that that's an important lesson that I learned through that experience that, you know, you have to humble yourselves a little bit when it comes to engaging communities like that. Because otherwise, you know, you're just going to be seen as, you know, inauthentic and, and as somebody who's just there to co-opt and patronize right. them. Well, okay, so... so- you 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 spend uh, uh, what was it three years uh, with the uh, with Governor McAuliffe? Yeah, I think total three years, including the campaign and then working in his administration. So, how does the White House opportunity come up for you? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the background is, uh, you know, before. Before I was considered specifically for the position, there was a lot of inter- internal dialogue that was happening within the White House, um, particularly among Muslim appointees who were already in the White House, who were saying basically, look, the need is greater than ever for this community to have somebody representing them at the highest levels of power. And right. there was an, uh, you know, an ongoing kind of persistent effort among people already at the White House to make sure that a position like this was created. I um, mean, you know, a lot of people will say, like, oh, why wasn't there a Muslim position created earlier in the administration? And, you know, my response to that is the need was never as great as it was in the past year and a half. Um, so, so would you say yeah. that the position arose to some extent based on the rhetoric that was being put out by the current president? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that it's, it's, it's no secret. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the rise in rhetoric – I think really came into focus in October, November, December of 2015. Right. Um, that's when you had, you know, the first mentions of the Muslim ban and, and things like Islam that. Islam hates I think, us. Exactly. Right. 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 Islam hates us and, and Muslims are the devils and, hmm. and all that. I mean, that all really came to a head at the end of 2015. And I think that that put such, it put things in such perspective for folks in government to realize that, you know what, this is no longer a fringe thing. Because, you know, I think before then, a lot of the attitude had been, why give more space to fringe groups to, to, to distribute their message? Why, like, give them validation? But I think there's a turning point that happened um, early on in the primary season, um, you know, with everything that we've been talking about at the end of, uh, near the end of 2015, where people realized, well, this is no longer rhetoric. This is actually rhetoric that has been translating into direct action hmm. against these communities. People are starting to actually get hurt because of this rhetoric. And it's not a flash in the pan thing. This is, we're starting to see a sea change. Yeah. Um, and I think because of that, you know, the idea of having somebody 
um, appointed who would directly be responsible for um, representing these communities, I think that need became much more urgent. And I will say that, you know, obviously the administration for the longest time had been doing engagement with the Muslim communities, but it had always been done kind of under a, a, a larger umbrella of faith outreach or, or things like that. There was never a very specific focus on this community. Yeah, but, um, I, yeah. I, I'm sorry, Zaki. I, I had a question about that, actually, because, like, I mean, you already kind of talked about the existence of, you know, Muslims who were already in the White House, even prior right. to the creation of the role, of, of your, your specific role. Um, so I imagine, I mean, those people were there not by maybe even, you know, given kind of what was some of the things that you said, like there was maybe not a uh, deliberate attempt to, to, to bring in Muslims, but they were there based on merit and the fact that, you know, they right i mean and so like totally. but, but but the voices were there within within the within the white house correct oh, oh yeah for sure i mean there were there were you know there's a, a really solid group of, of muslims who were in in pretty high level appointments too as well within the white house well before i even came on the scene are you are you at liberty to divulge names i'm mean, i'm just curious i mean like kind of like yeah did, yeah yeah, sure. One of the people who I think has done some of the most work is Romana Ahmed. Yeah, um, yeah. no Romana. She, well. uh, yeah. You know, she started out as an intern in the White House, fresh out of college. Right. Um, and she went from being an intern to being a staff assistant in the office where I where I uh, where I worked in the Office of Public Engagement. And she went from being a staff assistant then to the executive assistant to Ben Rhodes, who's the Deputy National Security Advisor. Um, and then by the time by the end of the administration, she was you know she. W- was a senior advisor to to Ben Rhodes, and so she, you know, had kind of this this great climb up from from there. And so when she was in my in the office that I was in, she had kind of the unofficial role of being the Muslim person by virtue of the fact that she was Muslim, <laughs> and she helped, you know, really uh, push forward a lot of the you know the White House iftars and a lot of the engagement stuff that's happened. And you know, right. President Obama ended up visiting, as you know, the mosque in Baltimore in January of 2016 last year. And Romana and, and a bunch of other, uh, I think, Muslim appointees also were very uh, instrumental in making sure that that happened um, and that it happened in the right way and it was the right messages being um, conveyed and all that. Um, there's other folks like Manar Wahid, who works in, who was the deputy director of immigration of the Domestic Policy Council. Um, again, she was doing immigration issues, but then, you know, immigration issues ended up also including things like NSEERS and including the refugee yeah. resettlement and things like that. Right. Um, you know, she's some, and then she also ended up taking on hate crimes as a very key component of her work. Um, and, you know, she also was a great resource to me. There's even also Muslims in, in other parts of the White House that I didn't even know existed or was important. Like, for example, there's this young woman named Asra Najam, who's a senior writer in the Office of Presidential Correspondence. And her job was to read and re- create responses to all of the incoming correspondence that came to the president. And that ended up becoming very powerful when uh, we wanted to we wanted to do a survey of letters that had been written to the president that came from Muslims. Mm. And so she helped us find this amazing letter. And, you know, Zeki was at the, uh, uh, the Eid reception where we had this young woman get up and introduce the president. Yeah. And she had written a letter to the president about her experience as a young black Muslim um, child of refugees from Somalia Mm. and all of the intersectionality of the hate that she faced um, as somebody who had that multi-part identity. And so she had written that letter to the president and Asra had found this letter and and showed it to us. And we were like, oh, wow, we definitely have to bring her to come and introduce the president. Um, But just having somebody like Asra in that position meant that we were able to have that kind of access. We were able to have somebody who who could help help us find those kinds of stories. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, there's, you know, there's yeah. Muslims all across the administration in, in different, uh, uh, positions and different roles. And I really credit them a lot for, for pushing for a position like this to be created. And I will say that, you know, I think, <laughs> I think that a lot of the thinking was, uh, we're going to create this position in the last year of this administration, but it'll also set a precedent for future administrations to follow. That was the hope. Um, Oops. Yeah. That was yeah. the, exactly. That, yeah. that was the hope. <laughs> yeah. The you know, hope. Uh, you, you alluded to the, the White House, uh, the Eid reception, in which yeah. um, obviously I was lucky enough to be there. And, you know, from, from my own perspective, I, I was kind of walking around the, 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 the East Wing where we were and just kind of looking around. And I, I, I'm just thinking to myself, how did I end up here? So <laughs> did, did you have a similar moment on your first day as you're working in the White House? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had uh, I felt like I was an imposter. <laughs> 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 like I, I, all these people are so smart, and this is such a like, you know, storied place that I'm in. Like I don't, I don't even know. There must be some mistake. <laughs> I mean, it took me a while to adjust to it, and, and then it's funny though. It, it is also funny how quickly you adjust to it because you're doing work and you're working like long hours, and the glamour of it all very quickly wears off. And in a way that actually was kind of sad because hmm. you know then I would bring people in for tours. I bring people in to visit, and every time I would see kind of their wide-eyed, um, and you know, response to being there, and I was like, "Oh, wow, that's right! Like, this is truly uh, yeah. an amazing, unique thing to be in this position." That's so, right. I know. I mean, uh, so I, I guess like the mundanity of everything that I was doing did sometimes like replace that feeling. But you know, by the end of it, especially after the election, I was like, "Oh, well, I'm not going to be here again for a while, so <laughs> I better take it all in." Right. I mean, you know, like, and I, I really appreciate you kind of like, you know, having that kind of sharing that experience as well, because I think it's important to not lose sight of that, because that's that's very real, very human and and just extraordinary in, in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, like the, and the reason I had asked the question that I had asked uh, about previous, you know, like people that were already in um, before you joined um, was because, you know, I think that, like for a lot of us, the concern from the outside, um, you know, uh, was that. You know, I remember early on in the administration, there was the attempt to create, I don't know if the exact specific, the specificity of the role, but, you know, like Mazen Asbahi, right? And then yeah, the, the, way, yeah. the, way, the way they sort of literally character assassinated that him and, and by, by guilt, by association sure. and all of that. And then just sure. the whole, you know, oh, Obama's a closeted Muslim kind of rhetoric that, 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 the, that the right wing was, was, was like stirring up. I mean, I think like for a lot of us, there was this concern that... You know, Obama's gonna like President Obama's going to like sort of double down in terms of like, you know, just just I, like uh, his, his attempts to distance himself from not only that rhetoric but any type of association yeah. with Muslims, Muslim communities, and so I think it's important for people to listen to to hear that that wasn't the case, that isn't the case, and that certainly behind the scenes there were a lot of Muslims who were you know I in the administration, uh, you know, in positions of. Uh, of a great level of leadership, and, and, and I think that's important for people to hear that. Absolutely, and I will say that uh, two things. First is that yeah. I think there was a maturation process that happened at the administration. I think that, hmm. um, you know, early on, uh, I do think, you know, perhaps justifiably so, um, yeah. there was this, uh, over, there, there was a lot of concern, yeah, that, you know, there would be a backlash against, you know, being too friendly with the Muslim community or representative of it for whatever reason. I think there was a lot of insecurity at first. Mm -hmm. um, but I think very quickly that, that that wore off and that stopped being the case. And I think that you had all these uh, squawkers and haters from the right wing who had so much power and so much influence, uh, you know, 2009, 2010, very quickly their influence waned and wore off until the point where I think that by the time I came along, you know, these guys are completely marginalized, or they were completely marginalized up until recently. I mean, you know, when I got hired, for, first they offered me the job, but then it was two months of vetting of me and my background, which is a standard procedure. But over the course of that, they found every single article that had been written about me, about me, you know, all kinds of accusations against me from the right wing. Wow. You know, story after story of all this complete, you know, complete manufactured BS. And I think it's a great credit to the administration that they recognized all of that immediately as being complete BS, and they hired me anyway. And they said, look, you know, we understand that all this crap that's out there, it's not coming from any kind of reliable source. Um, these are people whose careers are built on witch hunts against Muslims, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to give them the time of day. And and then I do think the fact that I was I was hired, even with... The fact that I used to work for Muslim Youth in North America, which was part of ISNA and all that stuff, it, it shows that there was a maturation process that happened, um, which I think is, is very important. And I think the other thing that I would say is, yeah, it's it's a, definitely the case that Muslims have been working in administration for the longest time. It's also important to know that they're working in all kinds of different positions where being a Muslim was just one part of their identity, which exactly. I think is even more powerful. I mean, it's the fact that we had Muslims working in the, you know, the technology space. We had Muslims working in the, the, the attorney's office. We had Muslims working in correspondence and on immigration issues and, and management and budget. It's a great thing that our experience was so 
diffused actually throughout the administration because ultimately that's how we're going to you know move forward it's not we don't always have to come to the table wearing our muslim hat yeah. just the fact that we are muslim and we're excelling in whatever field we're in is itself a service to the community um and and i think that that definitely was the case uh in the administration as well a, a, a kind of a diffuse congruence, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> I will, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Diffused yet congruent. Yeah. <laughs> Roll credits. <laughs> yes, I see, exactly. I couldn't resist, sorry. Um, uh, another one of those sort of meta questions, Zaki, sorry, um, uh, for you. And I, and I really, again, I, like the points you just made were, were extraordinary. Like that's exactly kind of the, some of the things I think that it was really important for people to hear. Um, Kind of from your own experiences, I mean, were you all, were you always, I, I guess, you know, in terms of like your own political uh, like philosophy and so on? I mean, were you always sort of like towards the democratic side, or you, I mean, like most of us, I think, coming growing up, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm certainly dating myself, but like certainly in the '80s, and I would say even in the in the in the in the '90s, I mean, the Muslim community by and large was kind of you know Republican, right? I mean, yeah. I think we've. I think there, there needs to be a whole like you. You talk about maturation. I think there's a there's a great book there, or something uh, that, that needs to be researched and written about, kind of the political, um, you know, um, just, just just the way the political uh, climate has informed the way Muslims have 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 kind of changed. I think from being kind of black stock Republicans through the seventies and eighties and nineties to kind of yeah. what we see now. But um, you know, so just from your own personal experiences, I mean, how was your kind of I guess you know, coming into your own po political reality? It's a good question. I mean, I think that for me, I was always, I was always a, you know, progressive, uh, liberal Democrat, whatever you want to say, before I even knew what those terms actually meant. I mean, I think it was just kind of innately yeah. my worldview was that. And I think a lot of that is influenced by my, by my family. I mean, the fact that, you know, Religion for us was never a compartmentalized thing. It was never like, um, you know, a dogmatic thing. It was always, I was raised to always be open to all different ideas and, and approaches and, 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 and thought. And, and I think that especially the kind I of the focus. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I, I think it's worth noting. I mean, again, someone who, again, predates you probably by a decade or so in Minna. Yeah. I mean, the Berzinji name, I mean, I, I think, is it your grandfather? Like, I mean, like Do Do Dr. Berzinji? Um, yeah, like yeah. One of the sort of, yeah. I mean, we're talking about pioneers. We're talking pioneers in the Muslim community in, in, in North America. So, I mean, I think when you talk about kind of the family you grow up in, I think it's, it's certainly for a lot of our listeners who are, are certainly of my ilk and, and were part of that early Minna generation. I mean, the Berzinji name is a synonymous as Isna and, you know, all the people that were part of it, so... Yeah. Yeah, and I think what people, <laughs> you know, for me it was always like my family always encouraged. They always encouraged openness. They always encouraged learning. Um, you know, my grandfather, Dr. Brzezinski, you know, he always pushed us to get to be civically in, in, involved and engaged. You know, even some of the he'd give clippers on the Affordable Care Act and the necess necessity for people to get involved in in, in making healthcare accessible for all. I mean. For us, it was always kind of intertwined, and I think that when it comes to you know my political affiliations, I, I learned very early on that the Democratic Party, at least the principles that they stood for, hmm. were that of pluralism, were that of of uh, obligation to those who were most downtrodden and most in need. Um, in a way that it was very clear to me from that age that I, I never saw that in the Republican Party. I never, you know. The idea of of every man for himself was never something that appealed to me, and I think that has as much to do with my religious upbringing as it does with kind of my own uh, evolving political views. And so, mm -hmm. I always saw the Democratic Party as being my home. I always saw um, progressivism as being my home because I always knew that for me, with my weird identity as somebody who's half Arab, half South Asian, mm -hmm. who's a nerd, who's you know. Um, <laughs> who's, you know, whatever, all kinds of weird wrinkles of my identity, I, I, I knew that I, I myself craved, a, I wanted people to be open to me, and so I would have to give back that openness. And I always, I only found that with, you know, with the Democratic Party and with progressives and the liberals, and I, I really ever, and I saw that kind of codified into a ideology uh, or into a, uh, uh, 
you know, in, into a, a position in a way that I never saw on the other side. So I, I think from the start, I never had that kind of struggle between, oh, Republican Party's family values and Democratic Party is, is too liberal values. To me, it was always like, well, no, the Democratic Party is a party for all. And it's a party of mutual respect and mutual admiration and liberty for all. And, you know, being a part of that doesn't mean that you give up your own identity. It means that you are confident in your own identity. Everybody respects you for practicing your identity and expressing yourself how you see fit, mm-hmm. while at the same time you afford that same luxury to others. That's <laughs> what it always meant to me to be a Democrat and to be a social progressive or whatever. You know, it's, it's so interesting because uh, – um... Obviously, everything you're saying, you know, I, I I have a lot of share a lot of common ground with you. And I mean, uh, going back to the the White House uh, Eid reception, what what my memory of that is, President Obama espousing exactly you know the values that you articulated just now, and and sort of me taking in the fact that you know Muslims are a thriving, vibrant part of the American experience and and whatever that yeah. entails. But I also remember juxtaposing it with that evening being in my hotel room. So I walk around the White House and whatnot, and then I go back to the hotel, and that was the night that uh, Donald Trump gave his acceptance speech at the Demo- at the Republican convention, where it was like yeah. the, the funhouse mirror, uh, inverse opposite version of the speech I just heard, you know, that afternoon. Um, my, my question is what, what was that like for you working in the white house? What, what was your experience with the Trump campaign? Did, at what point did it start occurring to you that this guy was very likely going to be the next president or did that ever occur? Uh, I mean, I will be honest. I don't think it ever occurred. Yeah. I don't think it, so from the beginning, I think not from the beginning, but as it got closer to the election, I think. What became clear was whether or not he won, whether or not he would win. It was clear that the changes he had already brought about were going to be irreversible. He had he had uncorked something. Exactly, he had already normalized hmm. hate speech. He had already normalized, you know, marginalization of a whole swath of communities. And even if he lost, that would still be the case. And that was something that was very important to me to, to always make that that point with everybody that I talked to because it was like. It's not like the climax is going to be the – well, I don't know. So then, so in a lot of ways, I guess the way that we viewed it was the climax is going to be the election. That's sure. going to be when things are out ahead, and things are going to continue to suck even if Clinton wins. Things are going to suck for a long time afterwards, and if and there could be a initial ramping up of hate even for people who are all disappointed that their person didn't win, yeah. but that eventually it would taper off. Now it seems that goalpost has been moved. We, the climax, I think – it's yet to come. Hmm. I think you're going to continue wow. to see further marginalization, further uh, you know spreading of hate speech. I think that you know uh, um, every move that our new president has made since his election has only underscored the fact that he's going to move towards a more divisive, more um, you know a more fear based uh, government than we've ever seen before. And so I, I I can't honestly say that I saw this as being a, a, a uh, potentiality and look I think that most I, th- I really do think that a lot of people now kind of you know, sort of acting like they had the hindsight to know that he was going to win in the past or something like that mm-hmm. I really think it came as a shock to everybody I, sure. I really think it, I came, I think it came as a shock to him himself <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, if if you look at the the video of him in the in the Oval Office with President Obama, I think that's yeah. that's the moment where he's like, "Uh oh, what did I just do?" <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. So, I mean, I, I I really don't, and I think that you know, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but I feel like in the White House, at least, the sense I, I think it came as a surprise to the majority of us. Sure. Um, because well, you know, I mean, so I, much I of remember, what we were. I remember reading that they they had no. They had they had no plan for a Trump victory, like what was supposed to happen. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think there were certain people probably who are, who are, I'm sure, out of due diligence, had come up with contingency plans and you know doomsday scenarios, sure. things like that. But Break those in of case us, of emergency. Think, exactly. But I think those of us who were more in these public engagement roles, I don't I don't think it occurred to us. I mean, I think, like I said, like for me, I had been preparing. My whole view of my job was. I'm only in here for a few months, but I'm going to create a foundation for engagement of this community. I'm going to increase the levels. I, I'm going to try to give more access to Muslim communities than they've ever had before so that in the future they'll be able to seize upon this 
and they'll be able to build off of it. And, right. you know, next administration can just go even further in the right direction. Hmm. Um, I never thought that, oh, my God, I'm going to have to go from having worked so hard to build something that can carry on in the future. I have to just preserve what little we've done. Wow. Um, and for me, what that meant was um, immediately after the election, I, I and I think this is also true for a lot of my colleagues as well with their communities, but I had to pivot to, okay, now the new reality is cannot – expect the next administration to be to do to be of any help to muslim community in fact they most likely will be the opposite of help <laughs> sure. it'll be actively hindering the community sure the best thing i can do right now in this moment is use the convening power of the white house to put people in a room together who otherwise would not be in a room together so that they can build relationships with each other that will exist outside of this administration outside of this white house and so that's why one of the most powerful events that we did came in like the last weeks of the administration. It was in mid-December, late December, where we brought 10 Muslims, 10 Jews, 10 African Americans, um, 10 Latinos, and 10 Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. We put them all together in a room. We said, look, we just brought you guys all here so that you would talk to each other. So you could share kind of what your top fears and top issues are um, in the future for your community hear from each other what your top issues are, and then have a constructive conversation on how each community can better support each other. And for me, like, you know, the circumstances of that meeting were obviously very, you know, depressing and dire. Yeah. But, and also it became even more depressing as we went around the room and each person shared, this is what we're so fearful of in our community. I mean, every single community had something very, you know, uh, pressing and urgent to say. But then you started seeing a synergy happen where, for example, we had a BLM activist say, you know, we've got a great grassroots network around this country, but we are constantly crippled by our chronic lack of funding. Sure. And there's a Muslim guy at the table who, you know, runs a foundation who said, oh, well, you know what? We've been actually looking for more opportunities to invest in, 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 in efforts like this to combat racial, uh, racial injustice or racial inequality. And so right there, there was a new connection that was made. And so me, that gave me hope. And that made me feel like, you know, the way forward for our community in particular is to realize that we are not an island unto ourselves and to realize that there are going to be so many other communities that are going to be facing the same exact kind of challenges and issues in the future. And we absolutely must, from this moment forward, be in the room with each other and be ready to build these kinds of bridges that I honestly don't think we've been building in any kind of meaningful way until this point. Um, and, and, you know, I think we've, we've done kind of more general, superficial, like, you know, acknowledgement of the fact that other communities are going through different struggles, but we haven't really like, sat down and hashed out a plan for how we're going to actively support other communities and their struggles and how, you know, we can provide inputs for them to support us in our work. And that's what has to happen now more than ever. Um, and so, you know, uh, that's what we did for the final weeks after the election. Me and my colleagues, we decided, you know, let's leverage all of our respective networks. Let's put our networks together. Let's get some synergy happening. Let's get people talking to each other. And let's make sure that that work continues on after we're gone. If we can do that, if we can help create a basic framework for mutual cooperation, then maybe all is not lost. So, with I mean, with that in mind, I mean, we're, we're at a nexus right now where it's, it's a, it's a historical nexus to what we don't know. Right. But I mean, yeah. I think, I think rarely do we have the opportunity to live through a historic moment and be like this right here, this is going to be big. Like five years from now, we're going to be looking back at this. I think, I think what we, the, the, the inauguration of Donald Trump is if nothing else, one of those pivot moments. Mm. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, I mean, what what are your thoughts? I mean, what de what were your thoughts as you were watching the the inauguration? What were your thoughts as you were watching the the women's mar march protests uh, the day after? And uh, I mean, what 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 do you think the Democratic Party needs to do? Certainly from here, but above and beyond that, I mean, as American Muslims, what do you think uh, uh, we need to be doing? That's about five questions. Yeah, one. sorry, it's, it's, <laughs> it's one question with uh, with sub questions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I will try to answer each of the sub questions. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> remember. And, uh, <laughs> so I think um, you know. I think it's like I said. I think that the uh, I think that for the Muslim community in particular, our path forward has to be 
building bridges with other communities. It has to be showing up, coming to the table for all the issues that matter to other communities. Not just out of a selfish thing of, oh, if we do it for them, they'll do it for us, but because it is legitimately the right thing to do. And I think that moving forward, of course, there's so many issues that we're going to be facing very quickly, very, you know, very rapidly um, from, you know, whatever form this proposed Muslim ban takes to extreme vetting, whatever that is, um, to, you know, a plethora of issues that I think we're going to see very quickly be rolled out by this new administration that are going to directly affect the Muslim community. But at the same time, the Latino community, for instance, is, is also shaking in fear because of all the promised actions that have come that could punish, uh, you know, especially mm. groups like the Dreamers, young uh, Latinos who grew up in this country, who have no other home but this country, right. and who came out of the shadows um, early on in this administration so that they could uh, be counted and they could be heard, and now are fe fearful that the very fact that they came out of the shadows means that they're going to become targets by the next administration. Yeah. Um, Muslim communities should, should show up for them. Um, same goes for the LGBT community. Same goes for the African American community, where issues of racial justice and criminal justice reform, in particular, were top priorities of, this administra of the past administration, and, we're, and we've made so much progress in the past few years, and that's all threatened um, by this new administration. Hmm. Muslims should show up for every single one of those issues, um, and I think that you know, on the one hand, it was depressing. I think in a lot of ways to watch the inauguration. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I was fortunate enough to, to go marching the next day in Washington and be a part of that mass of people. And it really was even more inspiring than I thought it would be hmm. because, uh, first of all, I think they only expected like 200,000 and ended up being whatever, 500,000, 600,000, however many people actually showed up in DC to the extent where I think like, it, it, like you couldn't even move because there were so many people there. Wow. But to see kind of everybody around me. No matter where they came from, it was clear that they that, that intersectionality of issues was at the forefront of everybody's minds, right? You would see like, uh, you know, I, I ran into this group of hijabis who were all wearing pink hijabs, and they were, each of them were carrying signs. One of them carried a sign that said like "Protect DACA," which is obviously defending you know young Latino immigrants. Right. Other one of them wearing, was holding a sign that said um, "Keep VAWA," the Violence Against Women Act which, you know, was a major thing, which should be a bipartisan issue, but for some reason, strangely isn't. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, another one of them was carrying a Black Lives Matter uh, uh, sign. And, you know, that's that's exactly... And, and, you know, everybody else that we ran into also was similarly... Um, had this had this idea and this perception, this worldview, that there are so many different communities that stand to lose moving forward, and it's important that we recognize and acknowledge the unique needs of each and every one of those communities. That's the sense that I got being in there. I, 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 for the first time I felt like, oh my God, I'm not alone. I'm not alone as a Muslim. I'm not alone as a progressive. Right. I'm not alone as, alone as whatever part of my identity. There are so many more people who are willing to literally walk the walk. Um, the question is moving forward, how do we kind of keep that energy sustained and how do we translate it into direct action? How do we translate it into sustained conversations between communities? And not just have everybody retreat back to their respective islands and their respective kind of isolated um, communities. Did I answer all your sub questions? You, you did. I was I was keeping track. <laughs> was kind of impressive. <laughs> uh, no, I mean I I think I think uh, what you just said sums up certainly a lot of what I was feeling, and and uh, I'll hazard a guess Pervez too, and and I mean I think uh, with with any situation, I, one thing I've been telling my students constantly because i mean i've i i've i teach many students who who are yeah. uh, undocumented and and just or just concerned you know and one thing i've said is look uh, you know the, if something's worth having it's worth fighting for and um this the, you know just because it, it doesn't go your way doesn't mean that that uh, the, the work stops you know yeah um, absolutely yeah. Well, with that in mind, I mean, what, what, I know you're kind of fun employed right now, but what's, uh, what's on your plate? I mean, what's the next mountain you want to climb? Yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> you know, so much of this has just been like up until the last minute, what can we do to, what can we do in the last minutes that we have in the white house mm -hmm. to the extent where by the time I was, I was done, it was, it was, it wasn't, it's not clear to me what the next step is and what the best path forward is and I don't want to rush into anything immediately. Sure. And I would say that before the election, 
I had a clearer idea of what I wanted to do. You know, hmm. my thought was, was, you know, we laid a foundation, you know, somebody, hopefully somebody else is going to come along and carry on the mantle. Um, even if maybe I could help with that transition process a little bit more, I, I would do that, but that, you know, I, I would kind of be able to step back and, 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 uh, be confident that the work would be carried on and I could go do something like private sector or whatever. Sure. Now, you know, I, I, I do feel like there's an obligation for the work that we've been doing to, to be continued and sustained in a very real way. I think for me, it's not exactly clear where I fit in, into the broader efforts that are already being done, um, what my role should be in that. Um, and so what I'm doing right now is I'm just kind of helping out anybody that needs help, um, I'll probably do a couple of consulting projects in the in the future. Just sort of, you know, I, I don't have any desire to be kind of at the forefront or, or in front of anything. I just want to, as much as I can, leverage, you know, the contacts, the networks that I've created, and the people that I know to help other people who are trying to do good work. That's where I see my role as being somebody who can help uplift others uh, and their work and connect them with other people who are doing great work. So I don't know what that means in the long term. Um, we'll figure it out. You know, my dream, of course, is to write a novel huh. or or to be a writer on a TV show full time. But uh, <laughs> well, you, you never know. I mean, the, you can you can leverage a lot of your experience in the political sphere into something, uh, you know, uh, yeah. there's I, I think uh, Eli Addy, who was like uh, Al Gore's like speechwriter, ended up becoming producer of the West Wing, you know. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, and, and from uh, what I've heard. No, I've ahead. heard that a lot of people. I've heard that a lot of people that go from like government positions to advising on those shows often don't actually have that much experience with, with like uh, storytelling or anything. It's just that they are able to market themselves as that. Yeah, so that gives me hope. Sure. <laughs> it was like a sure. Lawrence O'Donnell went went from political to Hollywood back to political. You know, that's right. Yeah. 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 So. Well, well, yeah. Zeki, with that in mind, anybody who's listening who who would be interested <laughs> in, in reaching out to you, what uh, what uh, what forum can they reach you at? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess you can catch me on Twitter. <laughs> is the uh, uh, my newly reactivated Twitter because the whole time I was in the White House, I couldn't use it. Oh, how um, funny. but <laughs> but now it's twitter.com slash z barzinji z b a r z i n j i. Feel free to hit me up there and. Yeah, take it from there. Take it from there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for for coming on with us. Uh, Absolutely, I, this is really insightful. I really enjoyed hearing your perspective of just being being there, kind of on the ground floor for a lot of uh, the history that we just witnessed. Yeah, thanks. No, I appreciate it. And I hope next time maybe we can just talk about nerd stuff the whole time. That, <laughs> that sounds like a plan to me. That's right. <laughs> uh, per- Pervez, you wanna you wanna close us out? Yeah, absolutely. They, again, uh, share uh, Zucky's thoughts uh, in thanking Zucky for you for joining us, and uh, it was a great show. Uh, comments, feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail dot com, or you can go to our Facebook page, engage us there, facebook dot com slash diffusecongruence. If you like the show, please do share it with others and give us a star rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find fine podcasts such as Diffuse Congruence. Well, with that, on behalf of my co-host, Professor Ahmed, this has been Diffuse Congruence. My name is Lucky Hudson, and we will catch you next time.